Um, anyway, uh, Cleburne's just a small town, 30 minutes here south of the uh, Metroplex, and the Christian Heritage Foundation is down there. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, um, and a little bit about the foundation, and that's what has been the vehicle to bring these scrolls here tonight with you. Um, but I wanted to echo something uh, they said, they mentioned about the um, Heim Singerman and uh, um, body armor for the Israeli soldiers. Uh, I know Heim personally. Uh, my wife grew up with Heim. And uh, she became a believer because of Heim. And I became a believer in part because of Heim and, and my wife. And uh, and so I wouldn't even be here tonight if it wasn't for that, that awesome man of God. And he, he's great soil to sow into. And the work that they're doing over there is incredible. So I encourage you to really search your hearts and consider sowing into that. Um, but uh, with that said, um, before I get into the uh, background of the foundation, um, Psalm chapter 12, verses 6 to 7 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in the furnace of the earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation and forever. The Lord himself and not another is the one who has preserved his word the door of the door from generation to generation he's used men to preserve his word but it's been the Lord himself that has preserved his word because our God is a promise keeping God you know I just came back from a mission trip in Poland and Ukraine and uh, had a chance to speak at a, a, a pastor's conference over there and um, many of these pastors were you know um asking about, you know, Israel and this whole conflict over there and, you know, who, whose land is it? You know, Israel is a nation once again, and Israel is back in the land, not because we deserved it or earned it, because our God is a promise-keeping God. And if you have an issue with Israel and Israel being in the land, you have an issue with God and his promises. And that's what I told to these these Polish and Ukrainian and Spanish and French and UK pastors that if, if you're having a, a, a challenge understanding why Israel's back in the land and you, you're, you're against that, you're, you're, you're coming up against the promise, the very promise of God that I will bring you back yet again and I'll put you back in the land. But, but more than that, to never be uprooted yes. again. Yeah. Israel's not going anywhere. And it's because our God is a promise-keeping God. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, in 1982, the Christian Heritage Foundation was established by Walter and Marianne Mice. Marianne is here tonight. Marianne can uh, say hi to everybody. And because of her and her amazing husband, um, that these scrolls are here with you tonight. And this is really an international treasure. What is here tonight, a lot of people will refer to these as the Torah scrolls. And that would be incorrect. Yes. Torah scroll is just one of 16 scrolls that it takes to make the complete Tanakh or the Hebrew Old Testament. Yeah. It takes 16 scrolls. Um, the most common is the Torah scroll, but to have all 16 scrolls together as a Tanakh is extremely rare. In fact, there are only five known complete sets on planet Earth. This is one of them. Israel herself does not have a complete Tanakh. We've had over 90 rabbis that have come from Israel to the sprawling metropolis of Cleveland, Texas to see this collection because they've never seen a complete Tanakh in their entire life. The Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. does not have a complete Tanakh in ancient scroll form. They invited this collection to come for six months a few years ago. So what is here tonight is truly an international treasure. We're going to get into that, but it's because of the Christian Heritage Foundation. So the foundation operates in Johnson County, Texas, and um, and what we do is we bless the body of Messiah in our county in the areas of benevolence, um, evangelism, and outreach. Um, and we support the local body of Messiah. We're never in competition with them. And um, we don't solicit funds or accept funds. Everything that we do is free and a blessing. Um, and the foundation seeks to do everything to assist the body of Messiah in reaching the world in our county for Yeshua as set out in John 3.16. Um, we 
We try to present with the sword the good news of the gospel to all the people of the county as correctly as possible and to urge the county as a whole to be more Messiah-centered and to encourage um, all the people in the county to attend a congregation of their choice, to help the business community find Yeshua's plan for success, and last but not least, to honor and stand with Israel. We have a program called Bridge of Hope. And I don't know of any other place in the United States or in the world where this is going on. We have over 30 churches in our county that have sister relationships to our Bridge of Hope program with Messianic congregations in the land of Israel. And we're going to try to extend that to every county in the state of Texas um, in, the, in this next year. We're going to try to create a Bridge of Hope program in every county. So... Let's get to the scrolls. So in the early 2000s, Walter um, um, had been bitten by the Israel bug. He, he read that promise of Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, that says, I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. It's like gravity. I mean, the law of gravity is in effect. If I, if I jump off the balcony up here, what's going to happen? I'm going to fall. Whether I, whether I believe in gravity or not doesn't really matter. Um, that, that, that law is in effect. And that, 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 that promise, that law of blessing and cursing is still in effect today. Very much so. Very powerfully so. Um, and so Walter became convicted of that. He wanted to bless Israel. Well, shortly after that, he was invited to a church in Johnson County, Bono Baptist Church. And there was this fellow who had a partial collection of the Tanakh, 10 scrolls, 10 of the 16 needed to have and he's doing a presentation. And so Walter, Mary Ann, and um, Executive Director Charles and his wife went to this presentation. And Walter was really impacted. And he went up to the fellow after the presentation. He's like, well, where do you keep these scrolls when, when you're not doing presentations? He goes, well, I keep them wrapped up in blankets in the trunk of my car. Aww. Well, Walter said, I have a, a proposition for you. I want to bless Israel and honor Israel. And I think this is one of my beginning steps. He goes, I want to offer you my best um, conference room at my business. We'll climate control it. We'll ensure the scrolls. We'll secure, uh, put in a security system. And when they're not traveling, they'll be in a secure, stable place. And then whenever you need them to do a presentation, you can go and get them. So the, the, the gentleman took Walter up on this offer. And for a year, these scrolls were at his, uh, at his business. But after a year, he came to Walter and said, hey, you know, I promised these scrolls to the uh, um, Creation Evidence Museum that was in the process of being built, and that it finally wrapped up being built, and he was going to have to move the scrolls to the, the Creation Evidence Museum. And Walter was dismayed, and he said, "Well, this has been the best year of my life, the best year of my business, having these having these scrolls here. It's kind of like when uh, the Ark was at Obed Edom's house for about three months. You know, he, he prospered, and um, and he said, "Well, I want to get a set of my own." And the gentleman said, "Well." Well, Walter, that's just impossible. These scrolls are incredibly rare. And he said, well, God immediately just loved that word impossible. He said, so buy me some scrolls. Well, it wasn't too long after that that um, uh, Walter had a sudden heart attack and was promoted to heaven. And uh, and then after that, um, this gentleman was in, in Israel and uh, he called uh, our executive director, Charles, and said, hey, I, I found a uh, five or six scrolls here, and um, I know Walter's passed on, and I know that he wanted to, to get these scrolls. Are you still interested? And so Walt, or Charles and Marianne talked it over, and they decided to get those scrolls, and that was the beginning of a multi-year process of the Lord bringing in a complete Tanakh, and today we're two scrolls short of two complete Tanakhs. Wow. Um, and so, and, and the thing is, is these, the, this Tanakh that's here tonight, um, it is available for the public to see. That's that's one of the big differences. And you go to the Vatican, unless you're a visiting scholar or a bishop, you know, and even if you were, they're not going to bring an entire Tanakh out for you to see. They might let you see one or two scrolls. Um, so the chance to see an entire an entire Tanakh is just incredibly rare. And so after the Lord brought these scrolls in, um, uh, pastors in the county began it have interest in, in, in seeing them and having their congregation see them and we started off in the county 
And then from there, by word of mouth, um, more opportunities in the Metroplex happened, and pretty soon we were going to outlying states. And now we've been all across the country, north, south, east, west, all over the country, schools, uh, synagogues, Messianic synagogues, mainstream synagogues, uh, churches, Jewish Heritage Festival in Ormond Beach, Florida, huge Jewish festival. Um, to bring this treasury, this international treasury of the word of the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's here this evening. So a lot of people will ask, are these originals? And the answer to that question would be both yes and no. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, this 500-year-old uh, Sephardic Torah here was not penned by Moses himself. That would be a first edition. And that would be pretty cool, but nobody has the first edition. Um, and this psalm scroll over here um, was not written by David. Again, that would be a first edition. And that would be really cool if we had the first ever psalm scroll. But nobody has that. Um, and so, um, but these are written in the method that they have been for millennia. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about that whole process. You know, we have an Isaiah scroll here tonight that's um, 350, 400 years old. And... Um, that's impressive. We have a replica of the Isaiah scroll um, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's the only complete intact biblical scroll. There were fragments of, of all the all the biblical, biblical Old Testament books except for Esther and the Dead Sea Scrolls, but the only complete intact biblical scroll was Isaiah. And that's carbon dated to be 24, 2500 years old. And we have a replica of that in the foundation. If you open, if you unroll that scroll and you unroll our Isaiah scroll, guess what you're going to Virtually no difference. Word for word. It's incredible. We're talking about 2,000 years of separation by a people who never met one another. And um, how could that be? Well, we're going to talk about this method of the writing of scrolls and the, and the, um, the, the process that the Sopharis, um, the Sopharim, the scribes, used to preserve the scrolls from generation to generation. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this is one of only five known complete sets um, in the world. And uh, each of these scrolls have their own unique story. Some have come from Russia, Poland, uh, Morocco, uh, Yemen, Israel. Um, and they have their own story, their own history. Um, and so let's talk about the Tanakh. You know, many of you are familiar with the word Tanakh in your Indian show hands. So about half the audience is mode. Tanakh is what I call an acronym. So we have three divisions of, of the Bible in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the Torah, which we commonly refer to as law, and if you've ever been to a synagogue service, which most of you probably have been. Um, the Torah scrolls taken out of the ark um, at a certain point in the service. And uh, we have this uh, special processional that we uh, take the scroll around and we worship the Lord. We're not worshiping the scroll, we're worshiping the God of the scroll. And we'll touch the cover, we'll touch our lips, and everybody will watch the scroll as it goes around. Um, and that's the Torah. We, we translate that as the law, but, um, but, but it's much more than the law. If you've read the first five books of the Bible, there's grace, there's mercy, there's love, um, um, there's God's plan A, you know, uh, you know uh, substitutionary sacrifice. Um, but the second division is the Nevi'im, the prophets. And then the third division is the Ketavim. When we take the first of those letter of those three words, or those three divisions, then we get that acronym Tanakh. And that's how we refer to the 39 books of what the Christian world would call the Old Testament. Um, and it takes 16 scrolls to contain the 39 books of the Old Testament or the Tanakh. Some of these scrolls are incredibly rare. Our psalm scroll up here is one of only eight psalm scrolls that are known on planet Earth. And this is the only one in the world that is available for the public to see. There's only seven other known psalm scrolls in the whole wide world. That's incredible. And it's here tonight with you. And you're going to get a chance to see this scroll. Afterwards, you're going to get a chance to come up, take pictures, see these scrolls. But it's incredible that it's here tonight. And it's here because our God... As it said in that psalm that I read at the beginning, he preserves his word from generation to generation. He himself is not another. Amen? Amen. All right. 
Well, you know, I mentioned about this whole processional where we take the Torah scroll out of the out of the ark and we worship the Lord, and everybody's everybody's following the Torah scroll as it goes around, and everybody's touching it, and worshiping, and then it comes up to the bema and it's unrolled and we read from it. And one of the things I think for people in the church world, because we speak in a lot of churches, is this incredible sense of reverential awe that this. This word of God is holy. It's holy, holy, holy. And I think we've lost touch with that sometimes in, in the church world. You know, it's amazing that we have the Bible in this form. And it's because we have this that we can have this. And it's because we have that and this that we can have the Bible in this form. And it's cool that we can have the Bible in this form. But when, we, when we're looking at it, sometimes we lose that, that sense that this word is the word of the living God. It's alive. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It is miraculous. And so one of the things that I, I think is we see this, you get this incredible sense of reverential awe when you see the scriptures in this form. But to take that into your heart. But the most important thing is not that we have these scrolls here tonight or we have this Bible here or the Bible on the phone. But the ultimate destination for his word is the tablet of your heart. Yeah. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. See, the Lord wants, he wants you to have this in your hand, but that's not the end destination. The tablet of your heart, that's the picture of Shavuot, Pentecost, the word of God. You know, the first Shavuot, when Moses came down the mountain, with the um, two sets of the Ten Commandments on stone. The children of Israel were worshiping a golden calf, Exodus 32. And Moses broke those tablets, destroyed that golden calf, and he told the Levites on the first Shavuot to go through the camp and kill. And on the first Shavuot, when the word of God came down on stone, it says there in Exodus 32, about 3,000 died. You fast forward 1,500 years, the power of the Ruach HaKodesh comes down upon the upon the Talmudim of Yeshua, the disciples. They go out the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, and they preach the Messiah, the good news, the gospel of Yeshua. And how many are saved? About 3,000. It's about the word going from stone to the tablet of your heart. Amen? Amen. All right. And that's holy. It's reverential all. And you know, that was one of the things when you when you lit the candle and you're talking about fire, it made, made me think about when the when the temple stood, they had a continuous fire on the altar, Ashtami, a uh, continuous fire. And they, the, 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 the Kohanim, the priests, they had to keep that fire going. And it, they weren't allowed to let it go out. Now, they didn't start the fire. The Lord himself started that fire. But they had the responsibility to steward that fire. And in a sense, you know, it says that, you know, we're, we're the temple now. And the altar is, is your heart. And that fire has been started by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. But we have a responsibility to steward that fire, not just in ourselves, but in every believer around us. Amen? All right, well, let's talk about um, the writing of the scrolls. So we've got some... Uh, uh, yeah, can I get you a little bit? So we've got some uh, some examples of what we call cloth in Hebrew. And uh, this is, most biblical scrolls were not written on, um, on uh, plant-based paper. These were written on what we call kosher animal skins. So this is 300-year-old deer. This is goat. This is um, new deer. Deer is one of the hardest ones to write on, the hardest ones to get to take ink, but it'll last incredibly long. What's, what's this one? This is unborn calf, calf, and this is, last but not least, sheep. So these are examples of the types of kosher animal skins that scroll, biblical scrolls would be written on. And it's one of the reasons why these scrolls have endured with door the door from generation to generation. When a so fair would write a scroll, he would expect that. <coughs> The minimal expectation is that, that scroll is going to last at least 200 years. 
And, and it's in part because they use these animal skins that these, these scrolls have lasted the test of time. That's why you've got a, a 500 year old um, Torah scroll here that you can still read like it was written yesterday. It's incredible. And um, now the other part is the ink. Now this ink, it's called gall ink. And um, I've got this bowl up here and it looks like crystal, but this is gum arabic. And it's the sap of the acacia tree. And it's one of the key components for the ink for writing biblical scrolls. Now, what else was the acacia tree used for in the Bible? Anybody know? Ark of the Covenant, table of showbread, altar of incense, poles for the tabernacle. But the acacia tree, the sap of that tree, was also the source for the key component for the very word of God. Now they would take this gum arabic, the sap of the acacia tree, and gall nuts. And this is a gall nut. And what this is, is a gall wasp will come and deposit an egg on the leaf of an oak tree. And um, the oak tree would form this nut around that wasp egg. Now when that gall wasp is big enough, it'll um, ready to hatch, it'll burrow its way out. And the soap bears would gather these up, and the rich in tannic acid makes that pure black ink. And uh, now, if the gall wasp doesn't make its way out, it makes some of the best ink, if the, if the wasp is still in there. And they, they can write with this ink for 200 years. It's incredible. That ink is good to write with for 200 years. Now, and it's one of the reasons why this ink lasts so long. Now, sometimes they have to go through a process of re-inking scrolls. And there are about 20 soap bearers in the world today that will re-ink and repair scrolls out of about 200 soap bearers that are alive in the world today. Now, when they're done making the ink and they've got the cloth, and one other thing about the cloth, especially in the time of Yeshua, um, the Sobers, the scribes, they would actually raise the animals that they were going to um, process into making the scrolls. And they would also harvest the sinew of that animal to make the thread to swell the panels of the scrolls together. Because oftentimes you take multiple animals to make a scroll. Um, all right. So now when it comes time to write, they would take this um, feather. This is a turkey feather. Um, we call this a, a, a clumus um, in Hebrew. And, uh, and uh, it's interesting. What they would do is they would shave the tip of the feather down like this. And it looks like a calligraphy pen. And in a sense, it's kind of one of the earliest forms of, of calligraphy. And, um, um, you know, do you know what uh, the American turkey is called in Hebrew? Tarnago Hodu, which means the rooster of India or the rooster that gives thanks. And what do, what do we eat at Thanksgiving? The, the rooster that gives thanks. Tarnago <laughs> Hodu. Um, but you know what? One of the things it makes me think of is there's this powerful song uh, in the Jewish mind. Odu Adonai Kito Kileolam Hato. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. You know, the Psalms of Entrance for Passover, um, that song's in there. We, we say that song during Passover. Um, Second Chronicles chapter 5, when Solomon, um, the son of David, um, dedicated the temple, um, they were singing that song. They were singing that song. And the kavod, the glory of God, came down to such a degree that people couldn't even stand up. And uh, uh, 15 chapters later, in Second Chronicles 20, Jehoshaphat, king of um, Jerusalem and Judah, uh, finds out that three armies are coming against them to destroy them. And he, and he, he cries out to the Lord, tears his clothes, and then he sends the army of, uh, uh, of, of Jerusalem and Judah out to meet these three armies. And he sends um, the Levites out at the head of the army, and they're singing this very same song. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. But Jeremiah 33, Jeremiah 33, this song appears again in verse 10, and it says, The voice of the bride, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of them who say, Give thanks to the Lord. Is good and his love and goes forever. And the context of that is, is Jerusalem and Israel, the desolate, being restored, place without man, without beast, 
is now as man and beast, Israel's back in the land. And there's a voice of the bride and a voice of the bridegroom, the voice of them who say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Because our God is a promise to be God. And so when I think of this, coming from a bird whose name is Fodu, in part, means give thanks. I think of the soul bears writing the scrolls, and they're writing the promises And our God is a promise keeping God, and we can give thanks for that. Amen? Amen. Now, if they don't have a, a turkey feather, they'll use a reek or connect. And it also makes me think of the promise in Isaiah 42, verse 1 through 4, where it's prophesies about Yeshua being a reek that was bruised but not broken. And so, no matter what you're using, the feather or the reek, it's a powerful prophetic um, picture of God's promises. Now, the Sophers, we call them Sophers style because they write the scrolls, Torah scrolls, but they write other biblical scrolls. But they also write the, the scrolls that go into Tefillin um, and the mezuzot, uh, um, the mezuzahs that we put on the doors. Like there's a mezuzah right there behind Stacy. And inside there's a little scroll. And the, and the Sophers, they write those. And so we have an acronym, Sophers style, because um, they write the Sefer Torah, the Tefillin, and the mezuzot. Um, um, scroll. And so there's only about 200 of these guys in the world and 20 of them are um, um, basically authorized to repair damaged scrolls. And, you know, so fair, you know, we translate the scribe, but one of the best translations for that is counter of letters. So when a so fair writes a, a Torah scroll, for instance, when he finishes that year and a half, year to year and a half process of writing, just the first five books, year to year and a half, in time investment, then he's going to count to make sure that there's 304,805 letters. Has anybody in here ever counted the 304,805? When I was at the Messiah Conference, there was a guy who said yes to that. Turns out he was a mathematician. 200,000? Anybody counts 100,000? 10,000? 5,000? 1,000? 500? Okay, we got, we got finally got some hands on 500. Can you imagine counting the 304,805? So a few years ago, we had a garage sale, and my son Joe said, I had just launched a pile of chains in the garage sale. And I'm counting the chains, I'm all excited. And uh, my son Joe comes over, dad, 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 dad. Uh, and he's asking me this very unimportant question. And I answer this very unimportant question, and I realize, oh my gosh, I forgot where I was. Can you imagine if you had to count to 304,000? But it's not just a sober who writes the scroll. But a second, more learned so fair, will count to make sure that there's 304,805 letters and none of them are misshapen or incorrect. And then a third so fair is going to count to make sure that there's 304,805 letters and none of them are misshapen or incorrect. And there's no other text, whether religious, secular, or historical, in all of humanity that has been preserved with that level of intentionality like the Bible, like the Word of God has been door to door from generation to generation. Amen. And you can have faith and confidence in that word. Amen? Amen. In fact, when you came in here tonight, how many of you checked the legs of your chair to see if it was going to hold you up? Anybody? Or did you just sit? What, there's one kid back here. You checked the chair. <laughs> you probably had a chair break on you before, right? <laughs> but everybody else just sat in the chair. And it's because you have faith in chairs. It's, it's blind faith. You're just expecting the chair to hold you up. But if you can count on a chair to hold you up, how much more can you count? And how much more confidence can, they, can you have in the Word of God itself? Amen? Amen. All right. So, the soul fairs have what I call, well, there's this Hebrew word that we use called kavanah. And I like to define it, my definition of that is holy intent or holy intentionality. It's this holy focus to be able to take take on an act like this. And when you look at these scrolls, like when you look at the Psalm scroll, it looks like it came off an excellent printer. And not only did they write these letters perfectly on there, but they score the lines on, on the page. And if you look at that, it's incredible to know that this has been done with a human hand. And um, and what they, they say the word, they write the word, they say the word. When they get to the name of God, they stand up, they declare that they're going to write the name of God. And they're going to have two witnesses as they write the name of God. And if they make a mistake with a regular word, they're allowed to try to fix it if they can. If they can't, they're going to have to replace that panel. 
if they make a, a mistake with the name of God, they have to replace that down and start all over again. No other text has been preserved this way. Religious, historical, or second. Um, so, when it comes time to read the scroll, now, a lot of you know what this is. How many of you guys know what this is? So, shout it out. Yeah. Yeah. And what does Yah mean? Hand. That's right. And on the tip of this a little stick is a hand with a pointy finger. And when we're reading from the scroll, like if you go to um, Beth Yeshua and you watch uh, Philip read from the scroll, um, he'll have one of these in hand. And he's using this to, to read along in the text. And he's not touching the scroll with his finger. Why? Because well, the oil and acid on your finger can damage the scroll, but also because it's holy, holy, holy. It's just the word of God. And so we use this device. One of the things when you look at um, a scroll, um, you know, a biblical book in, in scroll form, you'll notice that there are no chapters and verses. So if I told you to come up here and turn to Isaiah 31, verse 2, um, would it be hard? It, it would be, it'd be challenging, even if you can read Hebrew. Um, and this this comes in really handy when you're trying to figure out um, where you're at. And um, um, and so it's a continuous continuous stream of text. And um, and so we use this useful device called a yacht. Now we're going to highlight a few scrolls, and you guys are going to have an opportunity to come up and, and see the scrolls. The first one I want to highlight is the Esther scroll. Um, and somebody mentioned they're going to be doing their casting call for a forum play. Um, um, so this is open as in chapter nine. Now, what do you notice? What stands out? Big letters. And the big letters are the ten sons of Haman. <laughs> That's right, I said the ten sons of Haman. Yeah. There we go. So the ten sons, Haman and his ten sons, had this plan to destroy the Jewish people, but God had a, a rescue plan in place. He had an Esther and a Mordecai. Yeah, he's a well practiced. Um, you know, it's interesting, and this this was really profound for me because I was in Warsaw, Poland just a few weeks ago. At the, at the Jewish Museum there, on the grounds of the Warsaw Ghetto, 300,000 plus Jewish people were killed. And in there, about halfway through the museum, they chronicled the whole thousand year history of the Jewish people. They had a Torah scroll and an Esther scroll. And their Esther scroll was opened up to Esther 9 just like ours was. And one of the things you'll notice in there, in those midst of those supersized letters, are three really tiny letters. Um, uh, Atav, Sheen, and Isaiah. Uh, well, in Hebrew, our letters also are numbers. In English, you've got letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you have numbers. But in Hebrew, letters also have numeric value and serve as numbers. And that equals um, 707. Well, fit, the year 5707 um, was also uh, the end of 1946. And what happened in 1946? They ended the Nuremberg war trials and 10 Nazi war criminals were on, on gallows for trying to destroy the Jewish people. And the first Nazi that was hung at two in the morning, his name was Julius Stryker. And at two in the morning, as they're getting ready to pull the floor out from beneath them to hang him, he shouts Forum Fest 1946. Nobody wow. knows why he said that. Is it a coincidence that there in, the, in that scroll you've got super tiny letters that equal that that year 5707 when 10 Nazi war criminals? And you know, today we have that same spirit of Haman and Hitler and Hamas. They all want to destroy the people of God, Israel. Because they they reject the promise of God and the promise of God. And it'll say it again. Israel's back in the land because our God is a promise 
King King died, and he said he would bring them back, and they would never again be uprooted. Amen. Now, with that in mind, Stacey, uh, can I get you to hold up uh, this other scroll? This is a hot tour scroll, and this was written in the 1700s in Poland, and it was used in a Jewish school to teach the reading of Hebrew. It's really cool. It's got vowel pointers on it, too, which is really unique for a scroll of that day. Um, but this, when the Nazis rolled into this village in Poland, they rounded up all the kids from the school, and then a Nazi soldier took this scroll and put it on his bayonet, and then he tossed it from his bayonet to another bayonet and was stabbed five times by Nazi bayonets. Well, those Nazis are no longer here, but that scroll is here. And that scroll, is, it's a standing stone. It's a masabat, it's a living witness, a standing stone of our promise keeping God. And it doesn't matter how many Hamans, Hitlers, or Hamasas, or Hezbollahs that come along who want to destroy the people of God, none of them are going to succeed in their plan. Amen? Now, the last scroll I want to point out to you is the Psalm scroll, one of the rarest scrolls on the planet. And this is uh, taking the Psalms. And it's open to Psalm 119. One of the things you'll notice uh, is this is Psalm 119, verse 1. And we've got eight verses that begin with Allah. And then the second set of eight verses begin with Bait. And then the third set of eight verses begin with Gimel, Dalit, all through all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And so when you when you look in your English Bible thing, um, there was no way to translate that in English. And that's why. If you look in your English Bible, you'll see the Hebrew letter Aleph, or the phonetic spelling of Aleph, eight verses. And then you'll see the Hebrew letter Bay, or the phonetic spelling, and eight verses. They wanted to show you that this was an acrostic. It's a memorization tool. It's written with, it, with the intent for committing the word of God to your heart. That's why it says in Psalm 119, 11, thy word, I've hid in my heart, and I might not sin against you. This whole passage, this whole chapter was about taking his word, this miraculous word, and not just holding it in your hand, not just having it on your iPhone, but having it blazing on the tablet of your heart by the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, one other thing, y'all heard of Shofar earlier, and I don't really mean to explain the Shofar to you, I don't think, right? Somebody familiar with the shofar. And now you all know what this is, right? So many prayer call. And um, normally when we go in churches, we'll, we'll talk about the woman with the issue of blood grabbing a hold of the corner, uh, the kanaf of Yeshua's garment. But I don't want to talk about that tonight. I want to talk about Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. Zechariah Zachar 8, verse 23 speaks, says, Ten men from every nation and every language will come and grab hold of the Jew by the corner, the kanaf, of his garment and say, let us go with you for God is with you. Now, number one, how do you get ten men from every nation and every language? What is ten in Hebrew? Especially when we're thinking congregation. Or, or a minyan. You have to have at least 10 to have a congregation. He's telling you there's a complete congregation representative of every tribe, tongue, and, and language. We know what that is, right? That's the body of Messiah. And they're going to come and connect with Israel and grab hold of the Jew by the corner of the garment and say, let us go with you for God is with you. And this is just several chapters ahead of the nations, the governments of the world coming against regathered Israel to try to destroy her. But Jerusalem is going to be a stumbling stone, and, a, and, a, and, and, and we're, we're called to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom, Jerusalem. But peace doesn't just shalom doesn't just mean peace. It, the absence of conflict it means completeness and wholeness. When you're praying that, you're praying that Jerusalem will stay complete, not be divided, not be ripped apart, because that's what Satan wants to do. That's what the nations want to do. But God has put Israel back in the land because. He's a promise-keeping God, and he's raising up a Zechariah 8.23 generation. It's, it's men and women from every tribe, tongue, and nation who are part of the body of Messiah, and they're going to connect with Israel in the last day. Just like Ruth, when she said to Boaz, stretch out the corner of your garment over me, for you have the right of redemption over me. She was a Boaz, but she joined herself 
And Raut is a, is a contraction, means a friend with vision. But Orpa means to turn the back of the neck. She said, hey, Naomi, I love you, I'll go with you. But she didn't. She turned, her, she turned the back of her neck and she went back to Moab. But Raut was a friend with vision who joined, and it's a picture of the body of Messiah in the last days, who have that understanding, like Walter Mize did, that Genesis 12, 3 stands in effect today, that I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And so whether you're, you're Jewish by blood like I am or of the nations and you're engrafted in, we're, we're one new man and Messiah. But you all, have a, you all have a mandate to connect with Israel in this hour, to stand with Israel in this hour. And I want to tell you, have no fear because Israel will be here when the dust settles, when, when all armies of the world come to try to do whatever they're going to do. At the end of the day, our God, our promise-keeping God, is going to keep his word. And Israel's back in the land, and she will never be up there. Amen. 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 So what we're going to do, normally what we do is have you line up, and we have our oldest scroll, which we don't have here with us tonight. But what we want to do is we want to give you the opportunity to form a line, and I guess start over here would make most sense that way you can filter out uh, and uh, uh, so you start over here meet Miss Marianne and then you can come up here take photos of the scrolls don't take pictures of the or take pictures of scrolls but don't touch the scrolls please don't yes. and, and don't bring any drinks up in close proximity no. No. Um, to the scrolls but we want you to come up and we'll be up here to try to answer well, questions but also keep in mind because we have a lot of people um, that we want to try to keep in mind with, and even though we we'll answer questions, I'll probably hang out out here in the foyer so I don't walk the line down. Uh, but we want you to come up, see the scrolls in close proximity. Thank you so much. Um, can I get? Can I get you before I do that, before we wrap up, uh, I would like to give you guys the ironic blessing. Would that be all right? Yes. All right. Well, it's our custom to invite you to stand to receive this blessing. It comes with the promise that his name will be placed upon his people. All right. Good. How about that? Yes. Yeah. David. Yes. So. David Thomas. Here we go. Yevarek kavanai vayishmareka ya elanai ponavareka vihuneka isaruna. And this means the Lord will bless you and keep you because our God is a keeping God. The Lord will cause his face to shine upon you, the creator of the universe shining upon you because he knows the number of the hairs upon your head. And he will lift up his countenance upon you to give you shalom. That's not just the absence of conflict, but it's completeness and wholeness. So may he make you complete and whole in every area you have need. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. 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 All right. Come on up and see this folks.